And so this is a compact with the people. We do know that people expect essential services from the legislature. And so this is putting it out there um, saying that, hey, this is the agreement we have with the people on what's going to happen with the earnings reserve. But yeah, people are scared that uh, they're going to lose the dividends in the future. And that was very clear last night. And so what this amendment does is it constitutionalizes that dividend so they can have that dividend in the future. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, so, uh, Representative Tuck, you just said it takes away the government's ability to use it for other items. Doug Gardner yesterday said that essentially using May, it doesn't do that. The, the, the legislature would still um, have the authority to spend it um, in other ways. And uh, so would you support uh, a constitutional convention to include the language of shall? Uh, Constitutional conventions come up once every 10 years. Um, that's down the road. We got to solve this now. Um, if it's unconstitutional to put shall language in there, we'll look at that a little bit further. Um, but I will tell you this May language in the Constitution throws a lot more weight than a shall language in statute. So it's still way better than what we have right now in protecting the permanent fund dividend. Uh, I'm going to get back to the testimony. I'm sorry, Steve Quinn, uh, KTVA. Uh, I'd like to get back to the testimony. Were, were you surprised at the wide range of thoughts? I mean, some people didn't want using the POMV. Some people wanted every dollar back. It just, um, if that is a reflection of how the public feels, do you think you can get that buy-in in the legislature? Well, I'll just say that, you know, in the public testimony, there were a lot of people that were hurting in Alaska. As you heard in the testimony last uh, night, a lot of people that uh, did not have jobs, had large families, uh, had lost jobs. The Alaska economy is driving some of this. Um, and so, so that's very disturbing to all of us that, that that's taking place. Um, but protecting a dividend and a stable dividend in the future is very important to uh, most of us because uh, you know, it's such an important part for individuals as well as for the economy as a whole. And so we have been... Yeah, you have to remember that the Senate has proposed a thousand dollar dividend. We were at we were at twelve fifty. So we have always been higher than the Senate. We believe that the dividend is much more important than the Senate believes, obviously. And um, you know, we did have people calling in and saying, "Don't take the dividend. Institute an income tax." So there were. A, a number of people that said that. It wasn't the majority. The majority were saying, just don't take my dividend. Uh, you know, we, we really need that. And we agree. And that's why we're trying to get this um, through. Remember that nowhere in the Constitution is the dividend um, addressed. Um, this would, for the first time, be having the language of a dividend in the Constitution. And also there's a percentage. Uh, right now the bill says 33% of the um, amount taken uh, in the draw uh, from the uh, value of the fund would go for a dividend. It's going to be very hard for the legislature to come back after there's a vote of the people saying this amount should go for the dividend for them to reduce that. Right now there is no public vote there is nothing other than a past legislature that devised a formula and the current legislature is there and they're drawing up budgets and there's no public vote on that at all. So we want to make sure that there's a public vote if we can to make that stronger um, and harder for the legislature to dip into that amount. If, if I could add something real fast. Um, 
Steve, my sense of this is that of the 60 legislators, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 56 or 57 that, that believe a POMV, either statutory or constitutional, is necessary. There's one who resigned and is now running for governor who I think espoused the opinion that we didn't need to do that at all. There may be one other uh, in the legislature. So folks who think, and you know, I respect them all, but folks who think, well, we just don't need to use that sort of model, they're not likely to be happy in the end because I think everyone sort of understands with a two and a half billion dollar deficit, it's imperative that that happened and that it's bound to happen. Um, you know, short of uh, at $60 today is West Texas Intermediate, short of getting up to about $98 and sustaining that for some time, there just isn't the revenue to operate government. I think the other thing that's important about this resolution is the three-fourths protection that we've put in it. Uh, right now, we could spend earnings reserve money just like we spend general fund money. And I think that uh, the people are entitled to know that there's some level of heightened scrutiny and protection from further ad hoc draws from the fund. <clears throat> Becky Moore with AP. Um, I know finance has had its hands full and Representative Joseph and you said resources has been busy too. Um, what is the status of the oil tax bill? Is that sort of taking a back seat to see what happens with this resolution? And if the resolution isn't successful, would you, are you going to more aggressively push the changes to the oil tax regime? Uh, Becky, the, you know, the caucus broadly thinks that um, we are in this mid-range, which is frankly, historically, at least in recent years, low mid-range. But in the, I would say, 45 to 75 or 80 dollar price per barrel, that we are shorted, that we're not getting our historic fair share. And that's why you see that legislation. Uh, we think that advancing that legislation at the, at the appropriate time could be part of sort of a final package uh, of, or settlement with the other body. And um, we're still looking at that bill intensely. We're looking at making some adjustments that actually will create some more graduated sort of steps uh, in that range of prices that I've talked about. And uh, you may not have heard the last of the bill. This is another option to pass over to the Senate on coming up with some sort of comprehensive fiscal plan. And the reason why um, dividends are a threat, because we don't have a comprehensive fiscal plan. And so going back to your question, Steve, on, you know, how are we going to get this through the legislature? I guess the first question is, shall Alaskans have a dividend? And the answer to that is yes. Then what's the best way to protect that? We believe the best way to protect that was a fiscal plan that we passed over to the Senate last year. If we're not going to get that, then I think the next best thing is to constitutionalize it. And if I can r run with that theme, um, I mean, putting something in the Constitution, in my mind, is sort of uh, a way of expressing the importance of um, something to the people of Alaska. And I, I think to an op-ed, gosh, I think it was last week, if I'm getting my days right, and I really respect the author and I've worked closely with him on a number of issues, but the dividend program was described as a statutory, statutory entitlement. And I, I think I have a just sort of different perspective on the dividend program. And for every testifier last night in House Finance, if, um, if there was sort of concern about the mechanics of how to put the dividend into the Constitution, um, that concern probably should exist tenfold as to um, the, the other school of thought, which is that um, the dividend program is an entitlement program. Um, and I, I want to circle back to your question, Andrew, um, running with the fact that you said it was fair game for everybody, and that um, uh, Doug, Doug Gardner's testimony, I think, prompts a really important question that um, will be exciting to further explore. I would also note that um, Vic Fisher, if I'm remembering correctly, quoted in Alaska Daily, Anchorage Daily News, uh, article um, uh, offered, I think, fairly strongly a different perspective that a convention would not be required. Um, and, and I have seen legal memos that also have a um, different perspective than was expressed on the record. So um, just know that I, th I think there's probably a lot to unpack there, and, and it's a good, a good question to, um, to interrogate, um, but that there, there, there may be different layers to sort of peel back. 
Andrew Kitchman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, the one idea that does seem to be out there is a 50-50 split, which would mean um, 400 to $475 million less than uh, <clears throat> under a, a one two-thirds split. Uh, do you see the potential for additional revenue or cuts that would make up for that kind of uh, additional gap? Well, I would, I, I would just say that that was our, our first choice, was to diversify our revenues, to change oil taxes. I mean, right now, the oil tax rate between the companies and all, all governments is the lowest for the state you know, the lowest government take in history of our state. It's at right now at about 54% uh, goes to um, all governments of the oil tax. It, all the tax rates that were ever here were designed around anywhere between 66 to 71% of revenue would go to uh, government take in that scenario. And now we're at 52 to 54%. So. There's a uh, huge uh, deficit in in that area alone. So, any follow-up questions? Uh, would you support a 50-50 split? We're going to try to get 27 votes. So it all depends. I mean, it, on the HJR HJR 23, HJR 23. HAR 23 requires 27 votes. Um, we're not <clears throat> married to how it is today. We're open to working with all legislators to come up with a plan that's a compact with the people. And I just want to say one thing about uh, whether this is an entitlement or this is charity to Alaskans. It's not. It's justice. Because we do not own the mineral rights, the subsurface rights on our private lands. And this is a way that uh, uh, money is collected on behalf for the common good of, of the people. And so, um, so to protect the permanent fund dividend, we have HGR 23 out there. This is a starting point. And as we work through the legal issues, as we work through the policy, hopefully we'll come back with something that we can all agree on. And people should remember that this is a balance. You know, when people talk about the share, um, people are wanting services. I mean, people think that uh, public safety was cut too much in the cuts, and they're wanting more troopers, troopers, uh, posts were closed, those kind of things. Um, you see people complaining about road maintenance and not having the, the roadways maintained. You know, it, when you talk about government, it's essential and public services that are you're talking about. So that balance, the more that goes individually is less that is there for public services. And so somehow we have to balance revenues and expenditures for public services. And that's, that's the job of government, is to provide those public services. And public services includes public safety in the courts and all those other things, as well as road maintenance and maintaining our rural airports and, and those kind of things. So when we look at this balance, it's not, um, it's not government. It's public services you're balancing against the ratio with the dividend. So, those are all under consideration, and uh, we'll have to reach a point of uh, compromise that works for both public services and the amount of the PFD. Uh, if, I, if I could, uh, James, my, my concern with the 50-50 draw <clears throat> is that in order to fund the public services Representative Seaton talks about, you would have to draw even more from the ERA. Uh, you'd get up in the 6% range, and that would be unsustainable and then you would erode the ERA and you'd end up with no dividend. So, um, I mean, a 50-50 draw, we would love to do a 50-50 draw, but it creates an additional half billion dollar uh, hole in the deficit. That's what it does. And one thought on um, perhaps a compromise, and I mean, speaking to your question, James, as Representative Seaton noted, there's an amendment deadline today. I'm sure this bill, there would be lots of ideas on how it can change, and so I, I don't think anyone is, you know, wedded to every letter of every word of the legislation as exists, which is the case of just about any piece of legislation. Um, 
but I mean, a thought on compromise is I, I think all of us sort of see the uh, dividend amount as ideally a, a floor, like this is what feels right and just and, and trying to get that out there. And um, I mean, there's always the option for legislatures to appropriate additional money to a dividend if they choose, and then that has to be responsive to whatever the fiscal reality is, and that can be left to future legislatures as well. So, um, you know, there's lots of ways to sort of get at it, and um, I mean, we'll sort of see where the sentiment of the body is, um, and I'm, I'm sure the legislation will evolve accordingly. Excuse me. Just a question for Representative Seaton on schedule. Um, what is the timeline? What is the hope? for advancing potentially HAR 23 from committee, and what is the hope for advancing the operating budget from committee? Uh, this week for HAR 23 and next week for the operating budget. But do remember, we do have two uh, operating budget bills over to the Senate right now. We have the fast track and we have the early education uh, funding op uh, operating budget, so both of those there, the Senate has plenty of operating budgets to work on. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. <clears throat>